Good morning. Good morning. How are you? Good. Do you hear me all right? I can. Hello, I'm Tony Caldwell, and this is our first uh, podcast on the future of insurance. And I'm delighted to have with me this morning, Matt Massiello. Matt is the CEO of SIAA, Strategic Insurance Agents Alliance, based in New Hampshire. Uh, Matt runs an organization that has about 4,500 insurance agencies of all sizes, from brand new to tens of millions of premiums scattered in all 50 states. Uh, in addition to that, Matt is uh, involved in the retail insurance business and banking and a variety of other things. And so um, very well equipped to talk to us about the future of insurance distribution. In fact, um, Matt, you have a brand new book coming out, I think just in the next month or two on, uh, on something that'll be interesting to our listeners. What's the title of the book and what's it about? Uh, yeah, thanks, Tony. So the title of the book is Insurance Agency 4.0. Uh, and the premise of the book is, is basically we're in the fourth industrial revolution right now, which is really bringing uh, digital capabilities to all the prior industrial revolutions. And uh, insurance is, is very much caught up in that. And we're seeing that. We're seeing consumers looking to go more digital. We're seeing, obviously, our interaction with our carriers need to go more digital. Um, and, and, and certainly the evolving business model of the insurance agency needs to go more digital. Digital. So what Insurance Agency 4.0 does is sort of identify what's going on in the industry. I talk a little bit about InsurTech and the investments that are coming into the industry. Uh, but then what we do is we help an insurance agency sort of find their path. They find where they are today relative to their digital capabilities. And then we help them uh, define a digital strategy moving forward that they can implement in the coming years to continue to evolve their agency. Okay, so I think it's interesting that you've titled the book uh, Revolution 4.0 because that implies that fundamentally everything is going to be different. Uh, it's not, I gather that you see the future of insurance distribution not as a, a gradual, uh, slowly changing boiling of the frog, but a completely radical and new uh, way of doing business. Well, so it's Insurance Agency 4.0, um, and I actually do believe it's more of a, an evolution than a revolution. I do think that change is going to happen a little bit more rapidly. I think the current uh, pandemic has sort of added rocket fuel to people's need for increased digital capabilities. I, I don't think things are going to completely change overnight, but I think if insurance agencies aren't starting to evolve and make their changes now, uh, it's rapidly going to become too late. So those that are at least taking steps towards increasing their digital capabilities across their whole agency uh, are going to be in a good shape moving forward. Those that have sort of not started yet, uh, I think the clock's ticking. I think that with uh, uh, virtual employees and, and with the pandemic and with uh, the economy and all those things, uh, agencies have to be more efficient. We have to use these, these digital strategies. I think the big thing uh, in the book, the biggest takeaway in the book is a lot of times when we've talked about digital and the digitization of insurance agencies, it's really been with a marketing uh, uh, twist. And I think what we all need to understand is it's not just marketing. I think if you're going to build a digital strategy for an insurance agency, you have to first and foremost look at your people and make sure that they're prepared uh, and maybe they can help you with it. But then you have to focus uh, on your marketing, but then also your operations your service and your sales. It really needs to be a holistic view of the digital capabilities that an agency is going to need in the future and that the agencies are gonna to start to have to evolve into in the coming uh, months and years. Yeah, I wanna unpack this if I can with you just uh, for a few minutes. Uh, uh, but you know, you, you mentioned uh, operations and that's something that I've had a lot of interest in for a long time. In fact, my book uh, that was published earlier this year, uh, how the uncaptive agent really is a, uh, mostly about how to improve operations. And as I've thought about what COVID is doing, particularly in commercial insurance, where it's reducing income. Uh, and, and as I've talked to agents, in fact, I was on a call last week with agents from around the country, larger agents, who are really trying to figure out how to prospect in the Zoom world that we now live in. And it's, it's, it's a totally different way of going about trying to get new business. Uh, my point has been that uh, it takes about uh, $5 of new income to make up for $1 of reduced expenses. And that the big opportunity right now for agents is, is to really focus on operations and on expense re uh, reductions. So, you know, with that in mind, what, what do you see from a virtual or tech point of view that can really, uh, as you said, rock, provide the rocket fuel for small agencies, particularly 
in cutting expenses? Well, look, so I, I guess there's a couple points. One is, is technology uh, levels the playing field, uh, whether it's in operations or marketing, if you, if you do it the right way. I think the other point is, is the investments that agencies need to make in technology, um, uh, and we do look at these as investments, not expenses, uh, they make them more scalable. Um, the, the expenses or the investments around technology do not go up uh, as revenue goes up at the same uh, increments. And so it's going to make the agencies more efficient. Um, it's going to make the agencies, give the agencies the tools to manage better. You know, we talk in the book about uh, the key performance indicators, uh, sort of the, the basics that agencies should be looking at on a uh, weekly or a monthly basis, depending on how they're growing and how much new business they're writing. Uh, but, but the technology is going to make everybody scalable. Uh, it does require investment and it's not just monetary investment. I mean, there's a human capital investment. Uh, you have to prepare yourself as an agency principal to do these things and you have to make sure your staff is prepared as well. Uh, but in order to grow efficiently and effectively, we're going to have to increase our, our digital capabilities. And I think we've seen that with the pandemic. We've seen uh, agencies pivoted very quickly since we were essential. We pivoted very quickly to virtual work. Uh, about 75% of the agencies in the country uh, uh, do have their management systems hosted in the cloud. Hopefully by now that's 100%. Uh, and that did give everybody the ability to pivot rapidly, uh, send their folks home. And in some instances uh, right now, keep their folks home uh, as well. Okay. All right. Well, let's back up. And uh, so uh, uh, tell me what you think the uh, typical insurance agency looks like, let's say in uh, three years from now. So, and, and what's different about the agency three years from now in 2023 compared to the 2020 agency? Yeah, and I think it's important to note that, as you indicated, you know, we work with both startup uh, agencies, uh, you know, insurance professionals looking to uh, hang out their shingle and, and, and open their own independent agency, as well as existing independent agencies. I think the things that have made independent agencies successful over the years, um, you know, you always want to play to your success. So if you're looking at your agency and you know where you're successful, you want to do more of that. I think the big difference is, is we can start to plug digital capabilities into what makes an independent agency already successful to continue that runway. Uh, so if you are an independent agency and you do a great job uh, in your community, uh, uh, sponsoring, coaching, involved in Rotary and Chamber, then how do we overlay digital capabilities within marketing uh, for uh, you to build that digital footprint within your own community as well. So, you know, the strong attributes of an independent agency um, don't go away. We just enhance them with these digital capabilities across, as I've said before, market and operations uh, service uh, and sales. I think, you know, in three to five years, I, I you know, where independent agencies aren't going anywhere, you know, uh, we've had conversations around uh, the changes of the distribution channels uh, uh, within insurance and the exclusive channel is definitely seeing its shrinkage right now. Uh, some of the automobile insurance uh, uh, private passenger automobile insurance, we're seeing going to the direct side, and maybe some of that belongs over there, but we're seeing a big opportunity for independent agencies to grow market share in their communities in both uh, personal lines, preferred personal lines insurance, and obviously a blip with the economy right now, but obviously in commercial lines as well. And that that some of that requires building a better community brand uh, for these insurance agencies. At the end of the day, uh, uh, insurance agencies, I believe, are going to be uh, an advisor uh, in the risk coverage process in the future, and we're going to be an advocate for when self-service or other service capabilities or claims issues uh, come into play and our staff still needs to step in. But we're not going to be uh, organizations that are staffed for service. Uh, we're going to have to be uh, advising in sales. We're going to have to be business development focused. Uh, we're going to have to be uh, putting our service either into self-service uh, or service center capabilities, whether insurance companies or third-party providers. So when we're having our conversations with our clients, uh, we're not having transactional conversations with them. We're having meaningful conversations with them, whether it's on service capabilities or new policies. So uh, you, you mentioned service people uh, in, in an in a interesting way. So um, I gather you think that the customer service agent or the CSR, uh, as it's existed for the last you know, 100 years, is basically a, 
a dead position. Is that, is that fair? Yeah, how do you I see mean, that I, I, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it's heading. I think it's heading in that direction. You know, the, the, all the studies show that the consumers uh, they want a first call a resolution of matters. Uh, they don't want to call the agency and then the agency has to call the company and then the, you know, then the, the, the phone tag starts. Um, uh, consumers want to do it themselves uh, to a certain degree. Uh, we have do-it-yourself uh, capabilities in other parts of our lives. And we're beginning to expect that more and more from our insurance agencies. Um, you know, we've played on the CSR role over the years. And I think you're the one there. A couple other folks have coined the phrase, you know, it's not a customer service representative. It's a customer sales representative uh, moving forward. Uh, traditionally, and these are, look, these are the people we hired, these are the people we trained and we taught them how to service this business. But uh, with all of the other service capabilities out there, we need staffing in our agencies that's going to pivot to more business development, more revenue generation discussions uh, with our clients and how they act on a day-to-day -day basis. Well, you know, from an operating point of view, if, if you made the decision that, okay, we're not going to have customer service reps in our agency anymore, they're all going to be salespeople and we're gonna compensate them as salespeople. You still have a service function to perform, but if you outsource that to a third party, all the data shows that you can cut your expense factors by as much as a third. So, uh, you know, back to how you grill the agency, um, is there a strategy that you think makes sense right now um, for agents to, to, to think about embracing as far as uh, cutting expenses and moving service to a third party? Yeah, and I actually go through this a little bit in Insurance Agency 4.0, uh, and, and I start, as I said before, I start with the people. Uh, you've got to look at your people in your insurance agency. You've got to start with yourself, and then you've got to look at everybody and see, are they ready to start to put the service someplace else? And I want to be really clear here. When we talk about putting the service someplace else, a lot of this is the mundane transactional things that we're trying to push to an area where it can be done more efficiently. Um, we're not saying don't interact with your client. Um, you know, there's great practices in place where when a client reaches out to a service center, the agency has that information the next day and can make an outbound productive phone call uh, to discuss additional policies, make sure the service was okay, sort of like the hero syndrome uh, mm -hmm. uh, in, in working with the clients. The other thing I do want to point out, though, is I, I have a lot of agencies that will challenge me on the service center thing, and they'll say, look, you know, my clients want to deal with me. You know, service is my value proposition, and many right. of us have been hearing this now for decades, and every agency thinks that's what it is. Um, and I'll have some agencies say to me once in a while, well, look, you, you, you might think I should be in a service center or alternative service capabilities, but my phone is ringing off the hook. And my response to them every time is, well, what about the calls you're not getting, right? 25 to 40% of the phone calls that carrier service centers are receiving are uh, after hours uh, when insurance agencies are, open, are, are not open. Um, and what about those consumers or those clients in the agencies that during the daytime don't want to call their insurance agency, don't want to deal with their insurance. And so I think that there's two things. One, we have to evolve from an expense standpoint. You know, insurance agency, we have to build a model of an insurance agency that is a lower cost, more agile business than it's traditionally been. Uh, but, but equally as important, we have to provide the service capabilities that our clients want. And this is sort of that revolution versus evolution we were talking about a minute ago. Not every client's going to jump right into uh, uh, self-service capabilities or service center. So we do sort of have to bridge that gap where as an advocate in our agencies, we are still available to help the clients that do want to talk to us. But as folks, uh, uh, continue, the consumer continues to evolve, we can keep pushing them into the other avenues as well. So, you know, there's a lot of uh, conversation over the last couple of years about the coming uh, talent a desert, basically, in, in the business. Uh, I think something like, depending on what study you look at, between 50 and 70 percent of the employees in the industry are age eligible to retire over the next five to six years. Uh, and, and certainly, massive changes usually speed that up. There's a lot of people that are just bailing out of working altogether uh, as a consequence of COVID, for example. So, and, and, and older people that have been doing something for 30 or 40 years traditionally are the least likely to make changes uh, to way, the way they operate. So, with all that in mind, do you see a coming volatility in agency ownership? Do you think that the rate of agency ownership turnover, sales, mergers, acquisitions, uh, is going to be increasing over the next few years? 
Um, and if that happens, does that create additional opportunities for savvy younger entrepreneurs to come in with a totally different business model and take a lot of business away? Yeah, I think it does. I mean, a lot of, let's be honest, a lot of the agencies that get published in merger and acquisition lists and studies tend to be larger agencies. Uh, those are hard to replace, but those also create big vacuums in communities uh, where younger folks looking to come in and create insurance agencies in those communities can pick up some of that vacuum, especially in small commercial uh, and preferred personal lines. Um, I, I don't know if merger and acquisition is going to ramp up, but, but clearly there are agency uh, owners, there are agency principals out there that are not going to make this sort of digital transition and they have a great opportunity right now they can build a very strong very profitable book of business and very likely receive a, a nice return uh, when they sell it um, whether it's to a larger acquisition aggregator or whether it's to uh, another local agency coming in uh, if it's the uh, uh, more digitally focused agencies that are the acquirers, uh, the, the advantage to them is the fact that because of their technology, they will have the ability to bring that business in that they've acquired um, and bring it in efficiently and effectively and then implement or overlay their digital capabilities across everything and working with those clients. So it becomes a uh, more valuable, more efficient model for the buyer. Uh, and the seller does have the ability to obviously uh, uh, get rewarded for what they've built over the years. I do think there's a tipping point in the next couple of years. I think that agencies that have not sort of aggressively made some digital steps in their evolution, um, you know, if they've done some stuff and they've built profitable agencies, uh, they're going to get their value. But at what point does that value start to slip because the digital capabilities haven't sort of um, um, uh, stayed at pace? Uh, with the evolution of the uh, industry. So I think the next couple of years are actually going to be pretty good time uh, for, for agencies. Okay. There may be fewer agencies, but we're also seeing, or, or we may lose a lot of agencies through merger and acquisition, but um, we are seeing a lot of startup independent agencies uh, right now in the industry. I think it's a great time. I Personally, I've been doing this for 26, almost 27 years. I personally believe this is the greatest time to open or own an independent agency if you're willing to make the changes that you need to make. Yeah, so, so Peter Diamandis, uh, who wrote the, uh, he's written a number of books, Cyril Offner wrote uh, Abundance, uh, Abundance, and he says that every, there's six, six billion people on the face of the earth with one of these, and if you've got one of these, you're a potential uh, consumer for somebody that, that can reach you through this, right? So absent the, um, there's obviously legal and, and regulatory issues with insurance agents, but uh, the point is that um, the marketplace is also changing because of all, all of this technology. And earlier you mentioned, you know, a, a lot of things around the community agent, you know, Rotary and doing things in, in the community, defining your marketing and your marketplace as your local community, which has been the traditional way agents have operated. Um, you know, but with technology like we're using today, Zoom, for example, you and I are 1,500 miles apart having a face-to-face -face conversation. Do you see that the agent of the future is going to have a different way of defining the marketplace in which he works or she works? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a couple different ways to, to look at it. So I talk about uh, a lot uh, over the years. I've talked about building a community brand and, and overlaying an agency's digital capabilities to all of their traditional marketing and branding in their community to develop that community brand. Uh, the basic fact is, is, is the direct writers uh, have a marketing impact of somewhere between five and seven impressions a day. Uh, on our current clients. And so we have to increase the, the branding in our communities because these large uh, uh, spends uh, from a marketing standpoint, billions of dollars, they, the only thing they can't do is build a community brand. I think the pivot that you're now talking about as well for independent agencies is defining a community. So I've traditionally talked about that uh, geographic community where we can maybe put ourselves out there as a, a generalist. But now what agencies have the ability to do is take these digital capabilities and build a digital uh, community, uh, whether it's niche based or whether it's uh, the certain target markets they're going after. Uh, so so that, that digital community is an alternative for somebody that doesn't want to be restricted by the geography uh, or maybe the demographics within the geography that they're in. I think the second part of that is the whole virtual staffing uh, thing. Um, you know, I personally was an individual that for many years was not a fan of remote staff, uh, uh, had actually done it very early 
uh, in the idea and the concept of remote staff. And I don't think the uh, I don't think the management training was there. I don't think the technology was there with the with the pandemic hitting and with the move to virtual uh, and all of the different technology like Zoom, like Teams, uh, like some of the other things where we can manage key performance indicators. Do we really need staff in the office? I think for a, a culture to a certain degree we do, uh, but agencies have the ability to expand their their operations virtually. And, and I've talked to a lot of agencies now that say we sort of don't care where somebody lives. We just want the best person because we have the tools uh, to, to, to work with them. Uh, so, you know, both building a digital community uh, outside of your, your geographic restrictions and then staffing uh, outside of your geographic restrictions. Those are real things for agencies moving forward. And I think they open up a lot of opportunities. Well, and I, you, you've used a term that I, that I don't know that I've heard anybody else use, which is, you know, this term community in terms of rethinking what community means. You know, as you were saying that, I was thinking about two or three guys I know that uh, as a pilot, uh, I'm in a pilot community. We've replaced hangar flying that used to be done 30, 40 years ago with an online community. And anyway, there's three or four agents that are part of that community, has 60,000 people in it, if you will, uh, all on a common similar interest. And they uh, have built their entire books of business uh, inside that community because they're a part of it. And it isn't, everyone understands they're, they're not just selling insurance, but they're, you know, they're, they're contributing in many other ways. So I guess the challenge in that regard for agents is not necessarily to create a community, but perhaps it's to find the community that they want to engage in, just like you find the community you want to live in. Interesting way to think about building your book. Yeah, it absolutely is. And, and you know, that's the whole thing with, uh, with social media. And look, social media is not going anywhere. It's real. Uh, the, all the numbers and the statistics are there. I think what agencies need to understand and what principals and marketing, what marketing folks already know this, but what principals and producers need to understand is you're not going to sell anything through social media. Uh, you're going to build branding. You're going to build awareness. You're going to become viewed as an expert. You're going to get into these communities. Um, and then uh, you're going to make yourself as much center of mind as you can when people do think about their insurance within those those communities um and, and i just want to point this out too is um you know whether it's social media or whether it's all the digital marketing at the end of the day people still sell things um and so it is still a relationship business you're just using these digital tools uh to make your um uh make your process a little smoother so when you're having conversations with the uh prospect or the client as i've said before they're more meaningful conversations you've used your marketing and your digital capabilities to sort of build yourself up, build your brand and be seen as the, uh, the expert. Something else you said a minute ago, I want to come back to, which is um, you, you said acquisition aggregators. And, um, and I thought that was interesting. It may be the first time I've heard somebody refer to acquirers as aggregators, but in fact, that is what they're doing. Um, you know, the term aggregation in our industry tends to be more around uh, agent groups, uh, clusters, even uh, organizations like uh, like SIA, like your organization, where you're aggregating premium to create leverage uh, with insurance carriers. Um, I know a lot of those kinds of aggregators are now referred to as maps or marketing uh, market access providers. Um, but you know, so whether it's somebody acquiring businesses to aggregate premium, or if it's agents voluntarily joining some sort of organization to aggregate premium, it, it really seems like this is not just a part of the future, but it's part of today. But how do you see, and I read, I read last week that something like two thirds of all agencies now belong to some form of aggregation organization. Uh, how do you see that evolving into the future? I mean, is if an agency is not a part of something like that, are they left behind? Do they do they have a future? I mean, what does that look like? Um, yeah, so uh, I, I do think you have to be part of something bigger. Um, uh, there's a lot of things going on, you know, in my, in my book, uh, Insurance Agency 4.0, I, I make the comment there as I talk about insure tech, uh, that almost without exception, most uh, independent agencies, uh, we don't have the economies of scale to really ourselves get into insure tech. Uh, we have to align ourselves uh, with uh, organizations that are forward thinking, that are uh, looking to partner with the insurance companies and sort of understand the capabilities of the technology that is out there in the industry. Um, you know, it's also important to note that an independent agency, about 75, about 70% of the independent agencies in the channel are under about a million two or 
a million five, depending on whose study you look at, but under about a million two to a million five of, of revenue. Um, and so we've got to partner with somebody that can do these things, uh, that can help us with these things. Uh, it's funny, when I use the term acquisition aggregator, obviously there's also the term of aggregator uh, that's been around in the industry for quite a while. Um, sometimes when people start referencing aggregators, especially when you're talking at the company level, you do have to say, are you talking about acquisition aggregators or are you talking about agency aggregators? Because they, they, they are separate terms out there. But you, you, you've got to be part of something bigger um you know you mentioned market access providers you know the ability to provide access to markets it's really table stakes nowadays. Uh, you can access standard markets uh, through wholesalers. And I think within that two thirds, by the way, if, if it came out of, uh, I believe the uh, Big Eye Universe study does include wholesalers and, and brokers as well as market access providers. So the question isn't uh, joining an organization to get access to markets. The question is, how do you get access to markets? The question is, what is the financial relationship or reward in how you're gonna access the markets? And then are you aligned with somebody uh, that's going to be investing and be around for the future uh, because it is changing. Uh, and there are a lot of things happening. And the basic fact is, uh, and we know this as independent agencies, you're busy uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. You are, you, are, you are dealing with your clients, you are dealing with your staff and you are dealing with all that stuff. So who is sort of looking down the pathway and making sure that we're collectively heading in the right direction? So I, I do think people are gonna have to be part of organizations uh, and the definition of what a large agency is today is sort of, sort of fluid, it's sort of changed um, um, because the big ones are getting bigger uh, out there. So. Uh, I do think people have to look at who they're going to be part of and what they're going to do. So, you know, on the flip side, from big to small, um, you know, uh, Dan Sullivan, who runs a program called The Strategic Coach, said many, many years ago that the microcomputer was really the precursor to the new economy. And that um, if you had a computer, you could run an entire business from the computer. And uh, now we see, you know, uh, all the changes that, that, the pandemic are, are really creating uh, in terms of business. So is there an argument to be made that um, the successful insurance uh, entrepreneur of the future is a really successful salesperson who's outsourced everything else in his organization, living and working wherever he chooses and selling insurance wherever he chooses uh, without the trappings of the traditional insurance agency, the office and the uh, the rotary membership and all that other thing. I mean, what's, what does that future look like in your opinion? So, so I'm gonna answer that with a yes and a no, right? So I do think that if you're uh, an insurance professional and you're in your community and you're proud of your community and you wanna have your brick and mortar and you wanna have your sign and you wanna be involved in your community, that is a very viable business model. It just has to be enhanced with the digital capabilities. There should be no insurance principal out there that thinks that their office in their community is gonna disappear. I realize that sounds sort of old fashioned, but I, I do think that the local retail agency uh, is a viable business. On the flip side, uh, we are seeing uh, folks, and you and I both do business with some, that are creating completely virtual agencies. Uh, they have made the decision uh, that they will uh, be focused just on sales. Uh, these tend to be younger uh, uh, men and women, uh, but focused just on sales, and they're going to outsource everything they can do. And it's fun when you sort of talk to some of these folks because you start talking to them about how they're running their agency and what they're doing uh, and how they're handling their operations and their marketing. And because they're digital natives, they just assume this is the way it's supposed to be done. Um, so I, I do think the, the local community agency, uh, there's a lot of room for us uh, in the industry moving forward. I think we've all seen this flight to local um, and trying to do business uh, locally, and that's going to continue. Uh, but but there is a really strong business model for uh, virtual insurance agencies uh, moving forward. So I think it, you'll you'll probably see, you know, more of the virtual agencies start to come out, come about and start to grow. Well, I know in my own personal life, you know, I sold a, a business uh, in my early 30s and then moved into the insurance industry. And one of my goals, I, th I thought if I could, if I could just get rid of every employee that I had, life would be really great. And then if you could, didn't have to have any customers, it would be perfect, right? Um, well, you need customers, your clients. And so uh, the insurance industry to me, agency industry to me, meant you could really minimize, uh, that was, you know, a long time ago. Today, that capability is there in spades. And I just have to believe there are a lot of 
of you know aggressive, ambitious, uh, driven individuals who just don't want to have to manage an organization. Uh, and it seems like right now uh, is there's never been a better opportunity to build your own business and your own brand, uh, your own future uh, by outsourcing. So with technology, so. Uh, it'd be interesting to watch over the next couple of years and see how many more agencies get built that way. Yeah, and these are these are smart folks that are that are doing this. I think the other part of it too is us traditional insurance folks. You know, we're still 1.6 to 1.8 policies per customer. Uh, these folks, uh, uh, because they're sort of coming in with no preconceived notions, that doesn't make sense to them. Uh, and so they're immediately realizing that they can have a more efficient business with fewer customers. Uh, more policies, uh, less staff, more digital capabilities. I mean, it is a really cool model for the future for the right people. Yeah. So let's talk about this, this technology that we're using right now. We're, we're on a Zoom con uh, conversation and uh, everyone is Zooming these days. Um, you know, I, I had a conversation with a, with a friend a week or two ago who, who said that, that this is really early days. And he said, you know, think back to the beginning of the automobile. Uh, people actually described it in language, they didn't know what it was. So they, they called it the horseless carriage because that's how they understood it. And the same thing with, with what we call movies today, they, they didn't know how to think about that. So they called them moving pictures. So the whole uh, lexicon changed over time as people really understood what the technology could do for them. And clearly today when we're consuming media on a, you know, all kinds of platforms, uh, both uh, computer as well as television, everything else, it's completely unrecognizable to what the moving pictures were, say, in the early 20th century. So now we're on this, this technology we call Zoom. Uh, we're all learning how to have, you know, one-on-ones as well as meetings on Zoom. If we think of Zoom as the Model T of the new technical age that we're entering, uh, what, is, what is communication, face-to-face -face or person-to-person -person communication look like in the next three, four, five years? How does it evolve? And how does that impact the sales, marketing, service functions inside an insurance agency from your perspective? Well, there's a lot in there to unpack. And, and to your point, you know, we started the last century with, you know, converting from horse and buggies to cars. And we ended with the coming of the Internet age. People forget that the iPhone's only been around since 2007. Um, so not only are you 15, you and I 1500 miles apart, but I'm doing this, this, this zoom meeting completely with an iPhone on a Wi-Fi connection at home. Uh, and so, uh, the, the world is going to change a lot. And I think we've seen it. I, I I'll say it again. I think the the pandemic is sort of rocket fuel, uh, uh, to some of these changes. Uh, as I went through a lot of the, uh, the information I researched for, uh, independent agency 4.0. Um, you know, technology is really at its early stages right now. So uh, Zoom obviously has, has um, just blown up uh, because of the need for it. You know, they very uh, uh, smartly made it available for free to educational institutions in the spring. I have three young children, uh, two in high school, one in, in, in junior high, uh, that this is how they, they get educated. I, I think what we're going to have to see is with all the insure tech investment that's being made into the insurance industry, uh, that's being put into the insurance industry, um, you know, we're seeing the agency management systems get better. Um, we're seeing the capabilities increasing. I think that, you know, as I think about this question, there's a utopia out there. Uh, as I wrote in Insurance Agency 4.0, it's clear that all of our technology is having to come in bits and pieces, right? We have an agency management system, but now we need a CRM system. Uh, uh, we need somebody that assists us with our digital marketing. Uh, we need service capabilities or self-service capabilities. Uh, to me, a utopia ultimately becomes a full AMS system that includes strong CRM capabilities, customer relationship management capabilities that, inter that intertwines video and chat uh, and text, uh, as well as all of the traditional capabilities on policy service, which really makes us more efficient with our carriers. But more importantly, uh, we are interacting with our clients on portals that allow us to interact the way they want to interact. Um, you know, you and I both witness this, and I'm sure a lot of the viewers do as well. Uh, most people now, I'd say 50 to 60 percent of the time, uh, it's not let's have a call. It's I'm going to send you a Zoom link or I'm going to send right. you a Google Video link. Um, you know, I've done I've done both Zoom and, and Google Video links uh, with folks in Italy recently. I've done it with folks in England recently, uh, and so it's not just here in the U.S. So, um, you know, I think. Uh, 
trying to unpack the question, I think that the more we can get uh, the operations within the agencies to sort of play nice with each other uh, and integrate all of these things, uh, this is a great way to meet with clients. Uh, people are busy. Uh, if people still want to go to the golf course, if people still want to uh, do the other things, that's great. We should try and do it. It's going to be difficult again through the fall and this winter. Um, but this is real and it's an efficient way to do it. And we can kind of do it from anywhere uh, at this point. And we can still build relationships with them. Well, you know, I, uh, back to the Model T analogy, uh, I've done a lot of research on uh, virtual reality. And uh, there's a term called social virtual reality, which is the idea that you're using virtual reality to really immerse yourself in a social environment. Uh, right now, that technology is still limited by bandwidth and tethering and a bunch of other issues. But um, within the next three years or so, uh, something like the Google Glass of five to ten years ago will be back. Uh, but it'll be a virtual reality thing. So you just put on a pair of uh, uh, glasses and um, it, it, it's very clear that face-to-face -face communication where you can read the, the, the visual clues along with the oral clues is 75, 80% better. Uh, and the people prefer it, and to your point. And so, uh, you know, I just speculate that uh, we won't be Zooming in five years. We'll be putting on, you know, a, a set of, of eyeglasses and having this face-to-face -face conversation. But not only that, um, artificial intelligence and what it is uh, doing now. I, I, I talked to a gentleman last week who's built a hedge fund um, based on AI. And he said to me, he goes, I have millions of AIs. He's been working on this for a decade. I don't exactly know what that means, except that his AI is creating AI and, and you can instantly know whatever it is you need to know. So if that's true, and we can then just, you know, immediately call up um, whatever is in our CRM system or, you know, our agency management system. Um, information is sort of there as a, almost like wallpaper. Uh, and the, 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 um, the relationship uh, is, is where the focus is because the information is actually there in front of us. We have to spend no time at all to go mm -hmm. look it up. It's just, it's contextual. Um, I had a, you know, yesterday I was looking at my iPad I want to see a picture of something I took last week and it started and I realized that it had sorted all of my photographs into trips and uh, a different, you know, all kinds of categories. I didn't ask it to do that, but it was really interesting what it had done with it. That again, that's the model T of AI in terms of how it organizes information. So if your agency management system does the same thing, it knows you're having this conversation with a client and pulls up the most relevant information that it wants you to be sure and talk about with, um, with the client based on what, how you program the system. So it seems to me that we are in this window that we're talking about, three to five years, um, that that kind of stuff is going to be real uh, and that the people who master it have an amazing advantage, not just in the technical insurance area, but also in the relationship area. Well, what do you think of all yeah. that? Yeah, no, I, I agree. And it's funny, I hit on uh, AI. Uh, I, I don't hit on uh, virtual reality in the book, but I do hit on artificial intelligence, only to say that it's coming. It's real. Other industries are already doing it, but we are an industry that lags. And so uh, I, I agree that that's where we uh, will probably be in three to five years. I'm not sure the agency management systems are going to be the ones to deliver some of that stuff. Uh, the carriers are definitely out in front on that. They are working with InsureTech uh, and data-driven uh, organizations. And so I think that at least today in our Model T stage, um, we're going to have to let the carriers uh, sort of move forward with that. What I talk about in, in the book is that uh, it's a crawl, walk, run scenario. Uh, AI is only relevant if we have the data. And so agencies have to get much better about the data that we're using, the data in our systems. It's clean. It's manageable. We can use key performance indicators to manage our business. And what will happen is as AI, as the evolution of the technology platforms and the consumer uh, and all of these things continues to happen, if we're sort of blocking and tackling and following the technology process today into the next couple of years, AI just ultimately becomes a step. Uh, right now, when you sit here and we talk to independent agencies, and even some company folks, but certainly independent agencies about uh, artificial intelligence and virtual reality, that's a quantum leap. 
in, in, in our minds, right? So what are all of the sort of boxes that we need to check and the things that we need to do so that ultimately doesn't become a quantum leap? And, and I think that's certainly where my focus uh, has been is, is let's crawl and walk uh, over the next year to uh, let's make sure we're looking down the road and we know what these things are so we can turn them on when, uh, when we're ready, when the consumer's ready, and when the, when the industry's ready. Well, and so with that in mind, let's kind of wrap up with this, with, with, with some uh, thinking around what to do and when to do it. So, you know, obviously we're in the early days, but as you said earlier, it's rapidly developing. Again, I talked to uh, someone a couple of weeks ago, said, how's your business? And he said, it's 2025. So what do you mean? Well, we've made five years progress in the last six months because COVID forced us to do it. So that's kind of your point about rocket fuel. Um, and, and, the, and the pace of change, which is really accelerating. So if we're headed to AI-enabled information and social virtual reality by way of Zoom and building and participating in communities all over the place based on what it is we want to do, if that's our future, and our future is mostly in selling and, and it's uh, outsourcing service and uh, really uh, developing stronger operational capabilities so that we uh, can lower expenses and all those kinds of things. If that's the future of the agency over the next three to five years, what are the first one, two, three things that every agent's got to do? I mean, I'm, I like to ask, what's the one thing that you have to do now to start getting ready for that? Yeah, um, uh, great question. Uh, I think the one thing, it's not an executable item relative to technology or digital capabilities. It's a, having a plan. It's developing a plan, I think, is the most important thing. And I've talked to some very uh, forward-thinking uh, agencies relative to implementing digital capabilities. I actually participated in a panel uh, a couple of years ago on the future of uh, insurance distribution uh, that was sponsored by a carrier and, and, and one of the associations. And it was fascinating. I sat in the room, and there were some very successful traditional independent agencies in the room. Uh, and then there were some organizations that were already completely digital agencies that we're dealing with uh, uh, clients and dealing with carriers through application process interfaces, APIs, uh, virtual businesses. And, and I sort of sat in the middle of these agencies and listened to them and I was shocked. I was shocked that we still have traditional independent agencies uh, that are, that are um, uh, what I sort of call plain whack-a-mole. Right, you know, we're doing more digital marketing. We're moving to a service center. They're doing everything sort of on a reactive basis. And then the other end of the spectrum was these folks that had created agencies, and we see some of them on TV now or online that are digital uh, insurance agencies. And so, what I believe uh, the most important thing for an independent agency is today is it's to develop a plan. Don't play whack-a-mole. Um, uh, you know, if you're playing. Uh, defense relative to your technology and your digi digital capabilities, you're letting your business run you versus you run your business. And so I, I think a great first step is for an agency to take a step back. It is to understand where they are today. It is to understand what their needs are. It is to understand uh, the, the, um, uh, the resources that they need and then to build a plan. Uh, to increase their digital capabilities. And within a plan, they'll prioritize what's important to them. You know, um, uh, we held a, a program, SIA did, um, um, uh, I guess it was not quite a year ago, called the IA Evolve, uh, where we brought in uh, both carriers and uh, vendors uh, to talk about the digital capabilities that are available to insurance agencies within the industry. And when we were putting the IA Evolve program together, I thought, wouldn't it be great to give an insurance agency a roadmap on what their digital capabilities should be. And what we realized very quickly as we started to whiteboard this, which is where we came up with the people, marketing, operations, service, and sales, is that independent agencies are mavericks. We all think we're, we all think we're different. We all think our business is unique. So uh, we can't tell somebody what their digital path is going to be. What we want to do is give them the tools to decide, for them to, to define and decide what their digital path is going to be. Because they may already be doing a great job in marketing, but now they want to focus on sales and building a more efficient uh, business model. Um, so uh, so I, I, it's sort of a long-winded response to uh, developing a plan, massaging the plan, monitoring the plan, tweaking the plan, but having a plan uh, to be proactive relative to the digital capabilities, not reactive. 
Okay. So obviously insurance agency 4.0 is, or 4.0 is a resource to help agents uh, do that planning. Uh, and uh, so when's it going to be published? Where's it going to be available? How do I get a copy? Yeah, so uh, Insurance Agency 4.0 should be released sometime uh, before November 1st uh, is the goal. Uh, it will be available uh, on Amazon um, uh, and obviously directly from me uh, as well. Uh, so looking, f looking forward to get it out there. It is going to be a resource guide to help agencies uh, build and develop their own plan. Okay. Well, Matt Massiello, uh, CEO of SIAA, thank you so much for joining me today to have this. It's been a fascinating conversation. I've learned some things. I've got some new buzzwords I've got to go look up now and start paying attention to. It's like, these new things will be just like a sore toe. I know I'll be tripping over them in the future. And so thank you for stubbing my toe with information. And uh, thanks for being with me. And uh, we'll talk soon. Great. Thank you, Tony. Enjoyed it. Take care. I'm talking to independent agency owners about this all the time. If you'd like to have a more personalized conversation, click on the button or the link in the description and we'll make that happen. You can also reach out to me at tonycaldwell.net slash contact.